Okay, I'd like to call the regular school committee meeting to order, today being February 9th, 2016. This meeting is being recorded by the Peabody School Committee's recording secretary, Leanna Harris. The matters listed below on the agenda are those reasonably anticipated by the chair, which may be discussed at the meeting. Not all items listed may in fact be discussed, and other items not listed may also be brought up for discussion to the extent permitted by law. I'd like to first, if everybody could just please rise for a moment of silence. Thank you, and if you could remain standing for, a pledge of the, uh, for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty, justice for all. Thank you. And on the minutes, we still would wanted to hold the January 12th minutes. We still need to coordinate with Marge on a couple of things, but I know we're looking for approval of the January 4th minutes, which I thought we already did, um, and the January 26th minutes. So can we maybe have just a confirm, motion, confirming motion vote for January, January 4th? and January 27th. Second. Okay. We heard the motion by Mr. Rosignol, seconded by Mrs. Dunn. Roll call vote, please, on those minutes. Yes. Mr. Rosenau? Yes. Mrs. Papadich? Yes. Mrs. Dunn? Yes. Mr. Olympia? Yes. Mr. Amico? Yes. Okay, thank you. And uh, approval of bills? <laughs> I'm sorry, was there a motion? Oh, do you gotta, you gotta press the button here, the screen button to, to to speak. I'm ready now. <laughs> Motion to approve Warrant A number 2953 in the amount of $778,972.31 subject to audit. Second. You've heard the motion by Mrs. Carpenter for approval of Warrant 2953, seconded by Mr. Rosignol. Roll call vote, please. Mr. Hoffman? Yes. Mr. Rosignol? Yes. Mrs. Carpenter? Yes. Yes. Mr. Olympia? Yes. Mr. Amico? Yes. Motion to approve warrant B number 2954 in the amount of $114,229.66 subject to audit. Second. You've heard the motion by Mrs. Carpenter for approval of warrant 2954, seconded by Mr. Rosignol. Roll call vote, please. Mr. Hoffman? Yes. Yes. Mrs. Carpenter? Yes. Mrs. Dunn? Yes. Mr. Olympia? Yes. Yes. Great, thank you. Uh, before we go to continued business, if there's no objection, uh, we have some people today uh, for a presentation regarding our student-based health center. And if there's no objection, I'd like to go to that item next. No objection. Thank you. Allison, yep, come on up. Sure, do you want me to get a, let me get a chair for. Welcome, Allison, and uh, you as well, Sharon. If, um, Allison, if you could just please introduce yourself sure. for the record. And I have um, copies of the slides that I can hand out. Motion to receive. All in favor, it's approved. So my name is Allison Kilcoin, and I am a family nurse practitioner, and I'm the program manager of the Student Health Center at PVD um, High School. Little background about me, I am a graduate. Peabody High School. I actually, for those of you who've been in the community for a long time, ran a school-based health center out of the nurse's office from 2001 to 2003, uh, and then was the school nurse leader um, from 2003 to 2005, and then went to Lynn Community Health Center, 
ran a school-based health center in Lynn English High School for nine years. Um, and then in March 2014, when the school board went forward with um, approving opening a health center, I mysteriously got a phone call um, uh, to come and uh, help organize and open the um, the health center and it's been a, a great ride. So what I'm going to do is give you a little bit um, of a snapshot of both historically um, why we why we opened it for those of you that are new and and then a little bit of um, kind of a day in the life and what we're doing and I do have some of my staff here and I will take questions at the end if that's okay. We'll go to the first slide. can just hit the arrow on the here. So one thing I've kind of learned in, in my years of working in school-based health um, and working with the School-Based Health Alliance, which is the national group of advocacy um, for school-based health centers, is to always remember and start with your mission. And so I just want everyone here on the committee to know that this is our guiding principle and our mission. And it's about providing high quality, comprehensive health care to um, students so that we can support their optimal health and academic outcomes. Um, we can't do one without the other. And then in uh, March in 2014, the school committee, um, Sharon Cameron and, and our um, CEO, Maggie Brennan, brought some data to look at their need. Like, is there a need at Peabody High School? And what we, what we, when they looked at the nurses' data, they realized that really um, students were seeking services, that they, but they weren't able to get it. So the nurse's office really um, became the hub for students that were having a hard time um, and looking for behavioral health counseling. Go to the next one. And then the youth risk behavior survey in 2011 really showed that um, some indicators of both substance uh, use, abuse, suicide, um, and non-suicidal self-injury were all above the state average. So the thought was like, let's go forward with opening a health center that can address some of these needs. You can go to the next slide. And so our sponsoring agency is North Shore Community Health, and North Shore Community Health is um, a federally qualified health center that's here in Peabody on Foster Street in, um, in Salem and in Gloucester, and we provide comprehensive health care um, to all of uh, the North Shore Cape Ann residents, and really with a focus on health of social equity um, and bringing um, health to the communities. So you can go to the next slide, Sharon. So all students that are enrolled at the Student Health Center have access to services at these um, other sites at any point in time, including a 24-hour telephone on-call service, um, access to health insurance and enrollment and financial counseling, um, and we also have um, medical, behavioral, and dental health services at all of the sites. And so that was a great day. Um, uh, we had a little mishap with the scissors really didn't want to cut the ribbon but but it did happen but but we had good thing we have um, strong hands in the mayor he was able to cut the ribbon but uh, the health center was dedicated um, to the former state senator Fred Berry and um, he spoke and I think tears came to his eyes when really looking at how we can bring um, services to these kids and also what a really a community collaborative this was. I came, came in on the end and was there for the great day, but the, the, the community really, it was a proud day for Peabody um, when we opened in April. So there we are. Um, so I'm the nurse practitioner. I provide all the medical care. Jess Frost, she's our um, mental health counselor um, and therapist. She's here with us tonight. And then Carol Champany, she's our office coordinator. Um, that's the three of us. Okay. And so when you think about a school-based health center, it's not just um, behavioral health services or medical services. We're really um, a comprehensive uh, adolescent-focused health center. And so we give not only immunizations and physicals and sports physicals, confidential services, and behavioral health um, individual therapy, uh, but also we work to 
make Peabody High School a better environment. And that I'll talk about in a minute and with our um, Youth Advisory Council. All students that come in, uh, if they're under the age of 18, need to have a signed parental consent within the first two visits. We work really hard um, to do that. So far, we've got about 225 on file, we just counted today. And out of those, 157 have had at least one visit. We work with the, the teachers and um, trying to get parents to sign the consent so that if they do present for a visit, that, we, that it doesn't delay um, the, the visit. We can go on. And uh, Peabody High School has welcomed us really with open arms and is, as well as the, the city. Uh, we've had collaborations with Haven from Hunger. We have a, a satellite food pantry. Um, right now we're probably feeding um, 10 students a week um, or more. Um, we've had uh, donations from the community. Um, thank you, Mr. Olympia, for coming um, and doing some donations. But we've also um, can go down to the Haven at any point in time um, to get supplies. Uh, the art department has, they, we have a, an art uh, gallery right in our waiting room and so that's maintained by the Peabody High School Art Department and we've got ex we have different pictures up now we were open parents night and had a little art show um, so that's been a wonderful I sit on the Peabody Wellness Committee um, Healthy Peabody Collaborative has been wonderful with not only providing um, support but also funded some education for um, my staff to go to our national conference last year in Aux Austin, Texas and get some training on youth development um, and substance abuse um, prevention. Um, school nurses, I couldn't be there without them. They're just phenomenal. Um, one collaboration I'm surprised of, but it's great, is the athletic trainer. We, we work back and forth about when he's worried about um, someone comes to him with a medical question. It's, it's amazing where students will go when, they're, when they want information, and he'll send them to us. And then I've been working to do some uh, outreach to some area pediatricians and primary care providers as well. We have a community advisory board with members from uh, Mr. Rosignol from the school committee, uh, Ms. Murtag, um, but not only that, but also community members and uh, Peabody City Council, and I've just enlisted a couple of teachers at Peabody High School. We meet about four times a year, and it's really just guiding programming, keeping, um, keeping us, me, and, and the health center informed about what's going on in the community and what other resources there are. This, the Youth Advisory Council, so what we know from looking at successful health centers across the country is the most successful health centers have active youth engaged in, um, in their health center. And so we started like right off the bat with a Youth Advisory Council. It's led by Carol Champany. And I, I uh, very partial to this is the, this is the best part. We've got students that are coming. We've got about 25, not all students that come every week. They're self-selected. There is no criteria. It's just an after-school show up. Um, and they work on what's important to them. Like, what do they want to do? Everything is about what the youth feel is important to them. And what they've come up with so far, um, well, first they want, we were going to meet once a month, but they said no. And they meet two to three times a month. Um, what they came up with, which was really, impressive was stress management they said we're all stressed you know so how do we how do we combat that as a, in the school and as an environment and then this winter wonderland project which I'll have some pictures where they wanted to just have kids have other students feel comfortable and and be, feel proud about what their school looked like and bring some light and some positivity into their actual physical surroundings um, we actually did get a Best Bet grant from the PBD Education Foundation, which is going to be a great day. Um, we are doing a training with about eight to ten of the students um, on how to advocate for themselves at the state level, led, um, elected officials. And so we're going to go to um, an advocacy day for the Mass League of Community Health Centers. They're going to have a table. They're going to come up with a project for that table, and then we have appointments with. Uh, we're going to make appointments with our elected officials, um, and see how the the students are going to advocate for school-based health centers and resources in their community, whatever is important to them. And so, I may ask you, Mr. Mayor, for them to come and practice um, sometime about how do you talk to an elected official and get them to 
listen. Um, so that's going to be a really exciting um, day. The students are really looking forward to it. Go to the next slide. So there's a few little things. The stress management campaign, what they did is they um, took down words, you know, what feeling angry or depressed and or sad, and then came up with little, they were up for about a week, then they came up with how do we combat that, you know, take a walk, take a nap, and then the inspirational snowflakes. If you know the cafeteria at all, there are snowflakes all around the windows, and each snowflake is um, has an inspirational quote or a something positive written on it. So I want to give you a little bit of idea about visit data. It's pretty rough data, but just to give you a snapshot of, of what, our, what we're seeing walk through the doors. I, um, when we kind of sat down and thought about productivity and what we should be expect, we had no idea. Um, and so when I worked with our COO, I said, okay, 60 visits a month for medical. Like Just, just like put 60 a month. Um, as you can see, we are way above, that's both behavioral and men, uh, medical health, but if you go to the next slide, um, it breaks down the encounters through December 15th um, for Jess and for me, um, and so we've, and that's through the 15th, so the December numbers just for half of the month, we've been way above expected. So a little bit about the behavioral health visits. So Jess's caseload right now is at 46. These numbers, we just went through them um, today. Um, her, she's carried over about 14, I think, from last year, she, um, from, from that graduated last year to September. And then those, that's the breakdown of, the, of where the referrals came from. One, we, are, um, we have a nice relationship with Seath Bedard over the Peabody Learning Academy at the mall. And we met with him early in the year, and he said, can you do anything to help me? I, you know, and so we said, absolutely. These are the high-risk kids. So Jess spends most of her Fridays, at least till the early afternoon over there, seeing students. Um, OK, can go to the next slide. And then when they come in, they're referred, um, whenever we get a referral, sometimes that student already has outside counselors or parents would prefer them to be seen outside. Um, sometimes students decline. Um, but then um, we sit with the adjustment counselor and really evaluate. From this slide, really, to look at is the psychiatric medication evaluations. Um, we've had, we've recommended, Jess has recommended 23 students be evaluated. Um, and that's just from this week. Um, and those are some of the most common um, diagnosis, uh, diagnoses that, um, that Jess is seeing. Uh, we don't really have the ability right now in our electronic medical record to pull hard numbers, but we're working on that. And I know that um, Sharon and Brenda at the last meeting talked about the craft, and so um, which is the substance abuse screening. So every student that comes in, no matter if they're in for a shot for you know their tetanus shot, or they're seeing me for confidential reasons, or they're having their physical, they all are screened both for a behavioral health screening tool, which is called the, um, uh, the PSC, the Pediatric Symptom Checklist, and then the CRAFT, which is the behavioral health. I've been trained in the CRAFT and ESPERT, and so all students um, have this by me. And you can go to the next, I think you may have seen these numbers. Um, last time, so out of the, the total number of screens, 28% had a result of one or more. Two is considered a positive screen. They all get an intervention, or intervention by me, and out of those, 29 are currently in treatment um, with Jess. So the medical visit data, um, I do have some kind of numbers that we pulled from our electronic medical record. What I do want to say when I kind of dove into this, um, this is the first diagnosis. Um, so in any visit, you can have multiple diagnoses. These were pulled from the primary diagnosis of the visit. So just keep that in mind because people can have two, three, or four problems in a visit. And so moving forward, I'm going to try to get a little a better data. Um, our first most frequent um, visit was an encounter for immunization. Our second is um, encounter for contraceptive management. So that includes um, Plan B emergency contraception pregnancy testing. And then other specified counseling, I would probably put that under either behavioral health counseling, um, adjustment problems, problems at home, problems in interpersonal relationships. Um, then you can go to the next slide. 
And then um, this is some data that Brenda get, got for me because I work so closely uh, with the school nurses. So from September to, to December, there were 49 total individual referrals. And it's really split half and half, behavioral health complaint and a medical complaint. The behavioral health complaint isn't necessarily a referral for treatment. It's just that that's their complaint. Usually those students will be evaluated and screened by me. And then with a discussion uh, with Jess, we decide do they need treatment um, and need to be referred or do they, can I see them just if it's a relationship problem with a boyfriend or a girlfriend or something that I can deal with and then send them on their way. Um, the immunization, I don't, I, you may know that there's um, immunization compliance that's dictated by the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. And at the Student Health Center, I am considered a VFC site, a vaccine for children site. I have immunizations on site. I can um, look at immunization records and with parental permission actually give immunizations. And so when we looked, when I looked with Brenda Wolf at the immunization compliance in December 2014, there were 35 non-compliant students. And, um, at December 2015, there were 10. So we're, we're really working on getting these kids the care as soon as possible so they don't miss any school. Um, and then we've talked with Sharon and with um, Brenda that um, these, this is open for any, real, any child that can't get access to um, vaccines in a swift manner in the whole district. So we're gonna work together to see as if there's a need in another school and a parent could bring them to the high school, we're more than happy to, to do that for them. So a, a word about confidential services. So this is something I'm, I'm a little passionate about. So, um, so all st a lot of adolescents have a lot of questions that they are uncomfortable talking to their primary care provider about, to their parents about, to their teachers about. And so they find me and I have a very open relationship with them and give them a, a lot of ability to ask these questions and say, you can keep, I can keep this confidential. And we do that so that students come and get the service. And so, as you saw, like the second most frequent reason for seeking medical services is about pregnancy testing, um, emergency contraception. Um, all of those students get counseled by me, but they also get testing for um, gonorrhea, chlamydia, and HIV. So, so far, um, we've had eight positive chlamydia tests um, at the high school that either I've treated or um, their primary care provider has treated. And this is important from a public health standpoint and from my experience um, as a medical provider. In order for us to provide the best care, we really, uh, well really, you as a community should look at um, dispensing condoms through the Student Health Center by me um, and other contraceptives because immediate access is needed in order to decrease these numbers. I actually think they're probably lower. Uh, and as I push forward and start to screen more, we're going to see more. Um, and they're, you know, we have the tools um, in medicine to really help decrease these numbers. So it's, it's something that I professionally, in order for me to feel the best about giving the best care to these students, uh, need to have a little bit more tools um, on site. So that's what I'll say about that. So sustainability, you, pr you know, programs to sustainability and money is always on my mind because in 2003, we lost funding in our small program and then we closed the, we closed the program. And so that was really heartbreaking for me and for a lot of community members. So this is very, very rough data, but just to give you an idea, I can go. So School-Based Health Alliance really talks about sustainability of a program isn't just about money, it's about good partnering relationships, it's, which we have. It's about high quality care, which we have, and, and it's about diversifying your portfolio. And so it's not just about one type of revenue stream, it's about looking at multiple types of revenue streams. So you can go to the next slide. So our behavioral health revenue, I mean, she's just is so busy. Um, as the funds start to come in, um, we'll, moving forward, we'll have a better idea. So we just got our clinic license to provide behavioral health services was awarded by the state in November. And then we got um, credentialing with Mass Health. So as of right now, we are billing um, Mass Health for services. Um, we're awaiting credentialing with all the other commercial plans. We've got applications out. 
but uh, we're not milling anyone else yet because we're just waiting for that um, the last word with the plans. We do not balance bill. So if a plan only allows for um, one visit a month and we see them four times a month, we don't charge families. We also don't charge for co-payments. That's what I feel is covered under our, our grant. So if we kind of look at uh, the behavioral health numbers, if we're going to average 106 visits in a month um, with an average reimbursement of $62 a visit, um, it's very average. If we go to the next slide, we can, this is where it gets kind of tricky. We have revenue, we have expenses and we have revenue. I am not a CPA. I am not a money person, but health insurance and medical billing, there's a huge lag. So we bill out and so for the health safety net which is that confidential care uh pool of money that the state has that we have we know we have access to from september through november we build out twelve thousand dollars we expect to have that back but there's a 90 plus day wait for us to receive that revenue um, and then the behavioral health billing i haven't um, you know, we've been billing out, and I have. We will be able to look, look at the end of the year, like how long that that comes in. We're not. We don't know yet. So if you look at that short gap, we have a gap of funding. So if you go to the next slide, but I really think that we're in a lot. Much, um, we're in much better state um, than that. Uh, if we looked, if we kind of did a pro forma budget, which I didn't do an official one, but just look at, I think we're going to be able to get more medical billing in and behavioral health billing. Uh, Boston Children's Hospital does give us um, a, a operational grant, and we're working on other grants um, to help fill that gap. So we're looking right now at a, I think it's probably smaller right now than a $20,000 um, gap, but there, there's a gap. I'm, I'm pretty um, confident that we'll, we'll close it um, because of how busy we've been and partners that we've made in the community, uh, other small grants um, that we've had. So, go on. so really, I mean, it's a community collaborative. We um, believe that students are our future and that healthy students learn better and that they need a safe place to go and that our goal is to increase the time that our kids sit in the classroom so that they increase their um, their learning and we're looking at different ways to kind of prove that that's what we do and in, in data collection um, moving forward and then I think the last slide is for questions or comments well, thank you, Allison, and I want to thank you and your staff, everybody over at the Student Based Health Center. I, I know uh, it's helping kids, and certainly that um, was the hope behind this for the school committee, myself, all the administration, was that we can really make a difference, and you and your staff are making a difference. So uh, it's wonderful to have you come in and give us the presentation. Definitely things that we need to think about as a committee going forward mm -hmm. that you brought to light today. and. Um, uh, things that need to be discussed. So see what the committee wants to do. It might be something we need to discuss at a later meeting. Um, you know, we want to take in everything that you yeah. talked about today, and we might have to have a later meeting to discuss some of that, yeah. but certainly important, and, and we will discuss it. Um, committee members, Mr. Rosigno. Thank you. Through the chair to Allison, uh, thank you very much for coming before us. Um, I think that was really beneficial, especially for the new members, but really for us as a whole. Um, just to see your um, baby, I'll call it, <laughs> up and running and being so successful, it's just a tribute to you and your staff. Um, I look at um, the clinic as an amazing resource and an amazing asset that the high school didn't have just a short time ago. Um, when we first, as a board, looked at building the um, Learning Academy, Dave McGinney said, if we can save just one kid, we've done our job. And I look at this in similar light. With that, we're talking about academics. With this, we're talking about health. Mm -hmm. And without your health, it's, you can't go to class. You can't succeed. You can't grow as a student. Um, between the well visits, the physicals, behavioral health, the youth council, um, and, and the other piece that really struck me was feeding students. You're really encompassing and um, capturing the true needs of our neediest students. And I just can't thank you enough for all you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Olympio. 
Allison, uh, what you and your staff do, it's just an invaluable service to the community. Uh, just a wonderful job, and I'm just extremely proud of what you and your staff do there, and uh, you make the class of 1989 very proud. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Allison and Sharon and the entire staff, I just want to tell you something before I even start with a question. We see a lot of reports and a lot of presentations. I want to thank you. This is one of the best that I've seen. You gave us a lot of data. You explained it very well. And you showed us very clearly how much work you've already done from September till now. It, it is very impressive. The collaborations are really nice. Um, we, we did get to see the Winter Wonderland mm -hmm. display, and that was great. And I hadn't realized it was connected with the, with the uh, clinic. But all of this information is really very impressive, and you should be very proud of yourselves. And I want to say thank you for it, because um, I am truly impressed with the amount of work that has gone into integrating into the school, getting the kids involved, getting the staff involved. You've really done a, a, an excellent job. There was one question that I had, and I don't know whether you can answer it or whether Dr. Levine would, but when you have a student with substance abuse problems, mm -hmm. is there a process to refer them to Recovery High School? How, how would that work? Do you have to refer them back to the school, and then does it go through the school? This is a very, it's, it's difficult. So what I have said, so that we can build trust with the students and they feel comfortable um, disclosing to us, that as long as they are not intoxicated while they are in front of me or Jess, um, that we do not have to report it to the school. And that's to develop a relationship so that we can build trust so that they can be honest with us because unfortunately in schools they're very concerned that they're gonna get in trouble um, and then it there it the mental health and substance abuse resources and system is difficult it's difficult to get resources I know I you know um, Jess Frost is it has had a hard time at times um, not only getting parents to realize a very difficult thing, but also there aren't a lot of programs for adolescent substance abuse. Um, usually in my experience, and it, it could be different, that the recovery high school usually takes kids after they've gone through some type of rehab program, but not necessarily. We've not actually had to, we haven't gotten there yet. Um, I can tell you not only from the data, but also anecdotally, it is, it is challenging right now with students and the, and the students that we see that are using substances that aren't getting in trouble, right? So that there's a whole, they're the ones that are getting caught and getting in trouble, but we're kind of dealing with a group that maybe aren't um, and, and how to get them resources or um, evaluated for a different level of care is, is a challenge, so. Thank you, it's just a follow up. So really the students that you see mm -hmm. are actually coming to you themselves before, they're coming so to you for help. They're coming, they could be coming for um, an immunization and they sco score positive on a craft and then I have a conversation with them. So they may not, um, they could be in therapy for uh, depression and then through the therapeutic relationship they, they deal with Jess that, that comes to life that they're using substances. So I feel like in adolescence you can't separate. I think, I feel like it's all, about the whole child um, and so and we, we have had some referrals um, for the, the substance abuse but usually those kids are they're they're getting they're identified somewhere else um, the ones that we're seeing are the ones because we're asking does that make does that answer your question it does thank you because I know it's a very fine line and it's a difficult area to deal with but mm -hmm. that that does make sense and it clears it up thank you Thank you for all the answers. Thank you. Thank you. Stockman? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Allison, thank you for this presentation, and thank you, Sharon. Um, thank you to all your staff for all the 
wonderful work that you do. It was nice meeting you and your staff at the health center a few weeks ago. I do have a few questions regarding some of the slides and information that mm -hmm. you gave us tonight. You did give us a tremendous amount of information. Mm -hmm. It's a lot to digest. Um, if, if you have the uh, handout with you. Yep. So the second slide in the visit data. Yes. The one that separates. Right. Yep. It separates you and Jessica. Yes. Uh, and I see in for your projections or the budgeted amount of mm -hmm. um, patients that you would encounter, it's at 60 and Jessica's are at five. Right. That, you know, we had no idea what to expect. Right. Um, so we really, I think moving forward, we'll look at Jess's productivity and have a different, um, but that's from the last year, and um, but her actual visit numbers are the blue line. The five, I'm not sure if that, we hadn't projected her, well, her at all um, for this year because we didn't, we didn't know. Through, through, through the chairman, um, my real question is, Jessica is at present the primary mental health yes. provider. Yes. Are these, do these numbers reflect medical, or Those physical, are, or mental health? So the medical are my visits, and the behavioral health are Jessica's visits. So all of Jessica's visits that she has are um, her caseload of students that she's seeing for um, mental health, behavioral health services. So, so you, those are her visits. Through yes. this slide, you're saying that in October she had 136 visits, but that's that could be the same student, same student multiple right. times. So she has a caseload of 46. So she may see them once a week or every other week, or so that's the amount of visits. Yes. Okay, and then if we can move forward two slides, the first behavioral health visit yes. slide. Yeah. So um, this is what you're saying is a, is a weekly number for, for Jessica. So, I mean, I would defer to Jess is sees kids all day, so she probably weekly sees. So you probably are seeing 30 minute visits and you're probably seeing f at least 40 visits a week. Okay. Right. right. That you see every other. Right. Okay. A big part of voting in favor of this health center was for the mental health side of mm -hmm. it. So um, I don't know if it's good or bad, but right. I'm glad that there's a resource available to at least these 40 or 46 students or whatever right. the number is. And, and thank you for that. Yeah. Um, I just have a question on one more slide. I don't sure. mean to hold you up here. On if we can move forward to the first medical visit slide, I yes. believe it is, which is the, th yeah. Okay. The, so yes. you you describe this as the as the top five diagnosis is the slide. Yes. And you describe this as the primary diagnosis. Primary diagnosis. And I certainly understand that yep. there can be, as you multiple evaluate, there can be multiple diagnoses. But is it the primary diagnosis the complaint that the student presented with, or is that after your examination what you your you prime, your diagnosis is like they could have a they could have a complaint that is um, abdominal pain, but then your diagnosis is urinary tract infection, um, and so but they could come in for an immunization, and I also do they also have I do some substance abuse counseling with them. So um, this is the most frequent primary diagnosis. So, so this is if I can through yes. Mr. Mayor. Um, so this is uh, your. Hmm. This is your um, professional opinion as to what treatment they require um, after you do an examination. It's, it's yeah. It's, so it's the primary, you know. So if they present with a, a stomach pain. Yes. Um, but but there's a, a substance abuse issue. Right. The primary diagnosis may wind up being a substance abuse. Or it may. Or I mean, I think that for if you're looking at the contraceptive management question. Um, a girl may come in and say, um, I want a pregnancy test. Yeah. But, and the diagnosis is um, emergency contraception. So it's similar but different, you know. Um, they may come in with abdominal pain. They may tell the, the office, I have, a, I have a stomach ache, can I see Allison? And it may end up that what she really needed was a pregnancy test. Does that, does that make sense? They're related, but the diagnosis isn't necessarily a chief complaint. No. Sometimes it's different. Um, I think my thought was, I think out of those diagnoses, um, they could be, the first two could be more, right? So it could be that, um, that 
you know, my Z30.9 was a secondary diagnosis on a lot more. Yeah. So, so I, I do appreciate your candor on that. Um, is there, do you maintain any statistics as for um, what the patient presents with as opposed to the so diagnosis? So we have an electronic medical record and we have a data analyst through North Shore Community Health. So as we kind of go through this year, I think the summer is gonna be a time of kind of trying to tease out the data and okay. actually really what it looks like. So this is validated data from the electronic medical record from my visits from the primary diagnosis, but validating kind of other, it, it's a cumbersome process, but we do have resources, so I'll be looking at that after this school year. And again, in closing, thank you to you and your staff for all that you do. You're an uh, invaluable resource, I think, as my colleague, Mr. Olympio, said to our students, mm -hmm. and I, well, I certainly appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Mr. Amico? Hi, Allison. Hi. Thank you for coming, and thank you for your team, your whole group for coming. Um, this is so important to the city of Peabody and um, to all of us because these students are our future. And uh, it's amazing to think that where they would turn to or probably not turn to if you guys weren't available. Mm -hmm. So I just want to thank you very much uh, for helping us educate the whole child. And health is probably number one on that list. So mm -hmm. thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Rosignol? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, through you to Allison. Um, I know you just touched on it again co regarding contraception. Mm. Um, by law, what are you allowed to provide regarding contraception? So in the, Mass in the state of Massachusetts, mm -hmm. um, if any um, person, regardless of their age, um, comes into a health facility um, looking for information around pregnancy testing, family planning, STD, um, testing, counseling, treatment, and purely substance abuse, they mm -hmm. can consent themselves to those services. So uh, when we look at consent, the, the, the student is able to say, I'm consenting for this service, and then that is the, the patient provider privilege stays there. So I can't share mm -hmm. um, with, with um, parents, with teachers, with other providers without their explicit consent. Um, I always talk to them about the best way is the honest way, right? But it, it's, it's so that adolescents don't forego care, and that's mm -hmm. what we know about adolescents is they forego care because they're not comfortable. They're, things are changing and they're sensitive topics. Um, in the actual health center, um, you know, I'm a licensed medical nurse practitioner, so I can write prescriptions, I can do asthma treatments, I can, um, I have some medications that I can give out on mm -hmm. site. Um, so the, the students that were treated for chlamydia, I gave them the antibiotics right there. So I knew that they took them and I watched them take them. Um, we have an agreement that the, the school committee made to not dispense condoms, so I don't. And I don't dispense um, birth control, contraceptive medications. Um, yeah, but everything else is operating under a clinic license like any other facility. Would that answer your question? Yep. Um, through the chair, uh, there are how many student-based health centers in our general area? In our general area, I would say, well, in Massachusetts, there's around 52 to 54. They kind of open and close. Mm -hmm. um, and that, there's, oh gosh, there's got to be close to 11 in Lynn. Um, there's one in Salem. My agency runs um, a school-based health center in Salem High School and has since 1994. Um, there's one in Gloucester. And through the chair, out of those, how many, to your best knowledge, distribute condoms? I, I think that has to be, you know, I, I don't want to violate the open meeting law because we have to, that has to be on the agenda if we're going to get into that discussion. That's why I thought we were going to put that into a committee oh, I, if we I, were going to, because that's something that it's not on our agenda. True, and, and I don't mind putting it into subcommittee for a vote. I just want to get at least some knowledge behind it, even if we don't put it to a vote tonight, which is which is I'm, I'm completely fine with. I just wanted to know roughly what we're looking at so that when I do put this in subcommittee and we have these discussions, I at least have a knowledge base behind them. Okay. <laughs> um, so 
It is, it's such a touchy subject. Mm -hmm. um, I know they do in, um, in Chelsea, in Lynn, in Salem um, High School, they just got approval this past spring. Um, it's, it's, it's city, it's, it's a city kind of um, thing. It's not, it's not the majority, unfortunately. Okay. Um, unfortunately. Okay. Um, but Peabody is such a forward thinking, you know, community. Um, I think that you'll do what's best for, for your student. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Mrs. Carpenter. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation and the update. Um, I think you've proven that we have a city have made a wise choice mm -hmm. in having this program. Um, the sense of the committee, I feel, is that we're gonna be discussing the contraceptive issue at a later date. Mm -hmm. um, and what I would expect is if we're gonna put this into committee, I would have a lot of questions, so I'm hoping when we do discuss it, that she'll be able to come back mm -hmm. um, so that we can continue this conversation. That's all, but thank you. Sure, and, and, and I would envision inviting Sharon and Brenda as well, because uh, that's a discussion we need to have. The only thing I'm concerned about is that, you know, it's not, if we're gonna make votes, it can't be tonight because it's not on our agenda. The presentation's on our agenda, but not those specific issues. And I just wanna make sure that we, we're all set there. But we, I think that's important discussion to have, and we need to make a decision on that, or review it anyway. Okay, um, this is done. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As with all good reports, it generates more questions. This is actually one for Dr. Levine. Um, quite, quite often when we have discussed school, the need for school adjustment counselors, we've always, we've always wrestled with this. We know we don't have enough people doing that job. Um, but I see how um, you, you tracked students who see Jessica mm -hmm. for mental health services. I was wondering if we do tra uh, collate that type of data for our own uh, side on school adjustment councils, if we could get that information at some point, I'd just like to see a comparison. But if we're not doing that, I would like to ask that we do, just to see more data on the, we, we know there's a need for behavioral health assistance. and. I'm sure there are some students who are going to see the school adjustment counselor as opposed to going down to the clinic. And I think that those numbers might be complementary and we probably should really be aware of them. In the past, when there was a, a sense of trying to get that data, it was very difficult, just like you have said, because some of the students, it's not on a consistent basis. It might be someone who goes in every day to see that counselor for five minutes just to kind of touch base. But when you get right down to it, without that five minutes, that student would be cast adrift and they would really have a very difficult time of things. Um, I think it's all important anytime someone goes to see an adjustment counselor. If we could get that information, it's, it, it would be helpful, I think. Yes, I'd be happy to uh, speak with Will, and um, mm -hmm. I, I have a sense that a lot of that data is being tracked anyway. Good. But mm -hmm. uh, we can certainly put it together for uh, the school committee and present some general numbers, yeah. Thank you, that would be wonderful. Yeah. And thank you again. Great. Allison, thank you so much. Thank you. And um, yeah, there'll be a future meeting that we would like you to be at, so we'll let Absolutely. you know. And if there's any data or anything you'd like um, for me to try to grab from our electronic medical record, please just let me know. And if any of you haven't seen the health center, please come by at any time. Okay, thank you. Great, Sharon, thank you. Yep. Thank you. Um, Allison, you did a heck of a job. Thank you very much. I did speak with Allison a couple of times to ask her to keep it tight, and she did. And you did a wonderful job in the presentation. I, I just think it's important for the community to know how closely we work uh, with Sharon Cameron and the Department of Health. Um, she's involved in a number of initiatives uh, with us in the school department, um, tremendously knowledgeable and gives us a great deal of direction and, and advice. Uh, Sharon is always willing to uh, not only lend a helping hand, but to actually physically participate in uh, many of the committees that we have running. Um, she's an invaluable resource and I want to thank Sharon publicly for all the help that she gives the school department uh, on issues such as this. I want to thank the, the group. Um, I've seen you in action. Um, I know how important
the work is that you do, and I know from personal experience, um, having had a son in trouble in high school, um, how important it is to have adults to go to uh, where people uh, that are uh, maybe on the fence, uh, maybe in difficulty, um, maybe they haven't fallen off the cliff yet, need someone to talk to that care about them, uh, where they are safe, they feel safe, they can trust you, uh, and get the right advice uh, at the right time. Um, your, your service uh, really does, uh, in many ways, um, save lives. Uh, and I, I don't want to be dramatic about that, but it does. Uh, you, you are a, a, a point, um, you are a, a resource at a point in time where kids need you desperately. And I can't thank you enough for all the work that you do. Thank you so much. So, great, thank you. Next item, continued business. Mrs. Dunn, anything to report on the MSBA Higgins project? Uh, nothing at this point, just that um, things are progressing as normal and they're doing very well over there. Our next meeting for the Higgins School Building Committee will be the 25th of February at 4 p.m. Uh, right now it's set for the Kylie and uh, that's a little off of our schedule only because of school vacation. And once again, that is an open meeting. Everyone's invited to attend. Thank you, Mrs. Dunn. Uh, Mrs. Carpenter, anything to report on COPSYNC? Uh, no, Mr. Chairman. I was just looking for any updates or just some information. Um, this, uh, details might be a matter of executive session. Um, we're still working out some uh, kinks, and, uh, but we are working toward it and getting toward the goal that we uh, have all established. So I will give you, uh, I and Kara will give you an update uh, in our next executive session. Thank you. RFP for the after school program. Dr. Levine. Thank you, through the chair. Um, I have sent you both electronically and I think you have a hard copy tonight. Um, the work that we've done on uh, putting together an RFP, a, a draft RFP for uh, our after school programs. Um, I would ask you to read through it, uh, and I would ask for a vote on the 23rd um, with any changes that you might recommend so that we can move forward and begin the process of getting a recommendation to the school committee uh, within a reasonable amount of time. Uh, I have met with um, FKO regarding their extension for the summer program, um, and uh, we went over some data today. Uh, I asked uh, Deb Neal and the executive director for some further data and clarification before I recommend, make a recommendation to the mayor um, and uh, uh, sign a, uh, uh, an extension with them. Um, but they are prepared to run the summer program without a problem. Uh, as you will see in the RFP language, the contract runs from September 1st through August 31st so that we don't have to worry about extensions any longer. Everything will be incorporated into a one-year contract. Uh, with options for a second and third year. Um, so if you would be so kind as to look this over over the next week or 10 days and get me any recommendations for changes, uh, and then I will ask for a, uh, I'll get you a final draft uh, if any recommendations for changes come in, uh, and I will uh, get that before you uh, on the 23rd. I would like to thank Dan Doucette uh, for all the help that he gave me uh, in helping to formulate this uh, uh, um, information and um, uh, he spent a good couple of meetings with me and a number of uh, uh, hours over the phone and, and uh, on email so that we could get this to you and uh, thank you Dan for all your help. Thank you Dr. Levine. Uh, next item is statement of Mr. interests Mr. for Mr. the Mayor. Oh yes, Mr. Rosinal, I'm sorry. Actually. Oh sorry Mr. Hockman. Yeah, I, I believe that we would need a motion to receive this document. So I make that motion. Second. Thank you for that. Motion made by Mr. Hockman, seconded by Mr. Rosignol. On the motion, Mr. Rosignol? Uh, no, I just have questions that I want to pose to the group after accepting. Okay. Any comments or questions? Roll call vote, please, on acceptance of the proposed RFP. Mr. Hockman? Mr. Mayor. Sorry, Mr. Dunn, yeah, did. Go ahead. I think we were just receiving it as a draft and we'll have to take a, a vote on the, the final. Um, oh, did I, yeah, that's. Like, what the 26. I, that's not, okay, that's yeah. what I thought, did I, okay. Okay. 
Motion to receive the draft. Thank you. When is the um, when are the results of? Did we have a date on the survey as to when the survey information would be coming to us? This is done. If it'll stop snowing, <laughs> the re the results haven't been completely tabulated, but those will be sent out to the school committee. It's more for informational purposes and also to make sure that parental input uh, into the language in the RFP. And having read this, I can see many of the issues that were addressed in the in the survey are also addressed in the RFP. So I think you're going to see a good um, uh, complementary meshing of that information. But we will have those figures back as soon as as soon as possible. Thank you. Uh, roll call vote, please. So roll call vote to accept the draft proposal. To receive the draft. To receive it. I'm sorry. I keep saying accept. <laughs> to receive. Uh, yes. 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 Mr. Mayor, just one question. Mr. Rosignal. Just procedurally moving forward, we're accepting the draft today. We're going to re review it, and this will be on the next school committee meeting with any modifications, adjustments that we want to make. Should at that meeting then we set a date for a um, community meeting just to see if there's any other language that they would like to add? Well, that's, that's what I would like to do. I, I'd like to have a community meeting. I think the survey was an excellent idea and will provide us with a lot of input, uh, a lot of information that we could take in and potentially utilize in, in the RFP. Uh, but I think um, having a, a community forum, even if it's just here for uh, you know, a quick hour one evening, um, just if there's anybody who would want to come in and speak. I'm not sure people will because the, now we have the survey as well as a tool to be used. Uh, but I think it could just give us another uh, opportunity to hear from the public as to what they might need. So um, we could do that. I, I kind of felt like I wanted to get the survey information first then set up the meeting. Um, but I certainly would defer to the committee as to their thoughts. So through you to Ms. Dunn, do you believe that the survey information will be readily available before our next meeting? I think we'll probably have it out by the end of this week. So, so with that said, should we make a, um, uh, well then I'd recommend making a motion for maybe three weeks out setting a date for a community meeting just so that there's ample time for notice for the community. Dr. Levine. Thank you. Um, this is just food for thought. Uh, I have been involved in school committee meetings uh, where uh, the school committee meeting itself actually um, broke for a public hearing and then so that you don't have to first of all you don't have to come out more than one night uh, second of all people know it's part of the school committee meeting and you advertise the public hearing as um, uh, focused on uh, giving input so that uh, during uh, public participation or whatever you actually advertise the public hearing you break for the public hearing whoever's here may speak on it then you go back to regular session so I'm just recommending that as a possibility I, I think that's a good idea. And in fact, when you and I discussed, maybe we could just put this on prior to the next regular meeting. Uh, but I think linking the two makes a lot of sense. Um, so then we can have the survey information, have the community hearing. Then I think we're probably ready to discuss and, and get the, the RFP out. So um, we'll coordinate that as term of timing, but I think that makes a lot of sense. Mr. Hockman, did you? If I can, can we just make that by way of a motion? That, um, make a motion to follow the recommendation of the superintendent relative to the public meeting? Second. You heard the motion by Mr. Hockman, seconded by Mr. Olympio on the motion. Mr. Rosignal? Yes. So are we looking at having the community meeting at our next meeting before we've had to, time to adjust what our thoughts are on the RFP? Or are we looking at, and this is just for my own clarification, or are we looking at it at our next school committee meeting? So it wouldn't be... Let me say this. It'd be two. It'd be two meetings from now for the community meeting. Next meeting to to accept whatever recommendations and changes we have to the current RFP. Is, is that my understanding? No, that was a little different than I thought. But you might. That might be the better way to do it. I was thinking to do it all in one meeting, but we could do it in two meetings. 
Mrs. Dunn, what's your opinion? And I'll go to Mr. Amico next. S sorry. <laughs> um, actually, I thought it would be at our next meeting have that public hearing and then we would be discussing the RFP. If something really major came out of that public hearing, I would imagine that we would be able to make those adjustments in the document at that time. But I think if we put it out for two more meetings, that's a whole nother month. And I know you have to uh, begin this process, um, is it by, is it by March? Or with the extent, I'm sorry, with the, with the summer extension for the For Kids Only program, it, that does change things so that we're looking for someone to begin in September. I, I do know that does give you some time. But actually, um, I don't know. I, I just thought the public hearing and, and the discussion would all take place on the same night. But okay. just the way it seemed to be presented. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Miko? Um, I think for the chair, Mr. Rosnell, you had mentioned that on the 23rd, our next meeting, we'll go over this. And, and discuss any matters that we want to add to it or change. Or, and then on the following meeting, we would have the, the participation of the group in a community meeting. Is that, was that what you were? Well, yeah, Mr. Yeah. Rosinger, I, I, yeah, I think we should make it clear. So yeah, what is, so. That, that, that was my thought process, but if that's not the will of the board, that's okay, because we're still, m my main purpose was to have a rough draft, which is what we have currently. So if we end up having both simultaneously next meeting, I'm, I'm okay with that. I just wasn't sure which way the board wanted to go, whether we wanted to take the survey, take our suggestions, and then have a community meeting, the meeting following, or if we wanted to wrap this all up in next meeting. And either way, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that. Okay. Mr. Miko, did you? Yep. You just want to make sure you're clear on that? Thank you. Mr. Hockman? Um, thank you. Yeah, my preference would be to have the public meeting on the 23rd, our next, and also our input with the draft that the superintendent has provided us um, with the expectation of either coming to a final document on the 23rd or perhaps needing some additional time to contemplate based upon what is raised during the public meeting, but giving Dr. Levine ample time, as Ms. Ms. Dunn has indicated, to, to get this out uh, and have bids submitted and so forth. So that's what, what I would hope to see, to see happen. Okay. So why don't, we, why don't we go forward with that plan, marking this up prior to our next regular meeting on the 23rd, uh, maybe 6 o'clock or 6.30 before the regular 7.30 meeting. And uh, we'll have that input. We'll have the survey information. And then also, you know, from our, our work that each, each of us do individually, we can kind of come together with the plan. And if we do need that additional time, uh, we can set that up for the next, that first March meeting. Mr. Hockman? So based on the conversation, I would amend my motion to follow the recommendation of the mayor. That was good. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good. I was doing so well. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's unanimous. All in favor? Yeah. Excellent. Um, statement of interest for the Welch Center and Burke Schools. Uh, following up on our last meeting, we voted to... Uh, Submit to the MSBA request for um, three applications to be submitted uh, for statement of interest for work to be done at the Welch, the Center, and the Burke schools. Uh, next item would be, to, or the next action would be to go in front of the City Council for approval uh, for the MSBA submittal, and I intend to file that with the City Council to be received on February 25th and then marked up for March for the hearing. Uh, the applications or the statement of inter interests are due by April 8th, and that'll give us plenty of time to, to make sure that the council uh, is heard and votes on that to meet those time deadlines. So that's where we'll go on that one. Uh, Mr. Rosignol? We just need a motion stating the specific language. Would you like to make that? So I'd make a motion for the Burke School MSBA SOI. So moved. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman? Yep. It, you have to read all the language. I think Mr. Olympio would like to do that. Oh, wow. Okay. That's very nice of you, Mr. Olympio. Yes. 
Resolved. Uh, having uh, convened in an open meeting on February 9, 2016, prior to the closing date, the school committee of the city of Peabody, in accordance with its charter, bylaws, and ordinances, has voted to authorize the superintendent to submit to the Massachusetts School Building Authority the statement of interest form dated April 8, 2016, for the Burke School located at 127 Birch Street, Peabody, Massachusetts, which describes and explains the following deficiencies in priority categories for which an application may be submitted to the Massachusetts School Building Authority in the future. The MSBA priority selected is Priority 5, a replacement, renovation, and modernization of school facility systems such as roofs, windows, boilers, heat and ventilation systems to increase energy-related costs in a school facility. The specific objective of this SOI is to partner with the MSBA to replace of an obsolete unit ventilators, cabinet heaters, and gym cafeteria air handling units with modern HVAC equipment and controls. In addition, this SOI includes the restoration of casework along the classroom window walls interfacing with the new unit ventilators. The preliminary design for this unit ventilator and control portion of this work has already been accomplished and part of our successful green repair work. Repair of the heat and distribution system and the controls is necessary as a HV equipment at the Burke has reached the end of its useful life. And the school committee hereby further specifically acknowledges that by submitting the statement of interest form, the Massachusetts School Building Authority in no way guarantees the acceptance or the approval of an application, the awarding of a grant or any other funding commitment from the Massachusetts School Building Authority or commits the city, town, regional school districts to file an application for funding with the Massachusetts School Building Authority. You've heard the motion by Mr. Olympio, seconded by Mrs. Dunn. Roll call vote for the Burke School SOI. Yes. 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 Thank you, and Mr. Olympio, you have the next one. Oh, now we're going to Mr. Miko. Okay, so Mr. Miko, you have the center school. Resolved, having convened in an open meeting on February 9th, 2016, prior to the closing date, the school committee of the city of Peabody, in, a, in accordance with its charter, bylaws, and ordinances, has voted to authorize the superintendent to submit the Massachusetts School Building Authority, the Statement of Interest form, dated April 8, 2016, for the center school located at 18 Irving Street, PBD, Massachusetts, which describes and explains the following deficiencies in the priority categories for which an application may be submitted to the Massachusetts School Building Authority in the future. The MSBA priority selected is priority number seven, re replacement of or addition to obsolete buildings in order to provide for a full range of programs consistent with state and approved local requirements. The specific objective of this SOI is to seek MSBA support for a feasibility study for the replacement of the center school. The educational de deficits of the center school are articulated in the center school SOI and include the need, the need for gym space, cafeteria space, food service, servery, and kitchen space, much needed upgrades to classrooms, meeting rooms, electrical, plumbing, and HVAC systems. And the school committee hereby further specifically acknowledges that by submitting this statement of interest form, the Massachusetts School Building Authority in no way guarantees the acceptance or the approval of an application, the awarding of a grant, or any other funding com commitment from the Massachusetts School Building Authority, or commits the city, town, regional school district to filing an application for funding with the Massachusetts School Building Authority. Second. Thank you. You've heard the motion by Mr. Miko, seconded by Mr. Hockman for approval of the center school SOI. Roll call vote, please. Mr. Hockman? Yes. 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 Thank you. Mrs. Dunn, would you like the Walt School? Yes, I would. Thank you. <laughs> I thought you might. 
<laughs> Resolved, having convened in an open meeting on February 9th, 2016, prior to the closing date, the school committee of the city of Peabody, in accordance with its charter, bylaws, and ordinances, has voted to authorize the superintendent to submit to the Massachusetts School Building Authority the statement of interest form dated April 8th, 2016, for the Welch School, located at 50 Swampscott Avenue, Peabody, Massachusetts, which describes and explains the following deficiencies and the priority category for which an application may be submitted to the Massachusetts School Building Authority in the future. The MSBA priority selected is priority number five, quote, replacement, renovation, or modernization of school facility systems, such as roofs, windows, boilers, heating, and ventilation systems to increase energy-related costs in a school facility, end quote. The specific objective of this SOI is to seek MSBA support for building repair, including conversion of this all electrically heated school to natural gas, replacement of the existing obsolete and no longer serviceable HVAC system, and controls and replacement of windows and exterior doors throughout the school. And the school committee hereby further specifically acknowledges that by submitting this statement of interest form, the Massachusetts School Building Authority in no way guarantees the acceptance or the approval of an application, the awarding of a grant, or any other funding commitment from the Massachusetts School Building Authority, or commits the city, town, or regional school district to, fill, to filing an application for funding with the Massachusetts School Building Authority. So moved. Second. Heard the motion by Mrs. Dunn, seconded by Mr. Rosignol for approval of the Welch School SOI. Roll call vote, please. Mr. Hawkins? Yes. 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 Thank you. Uh, next item is public participation. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to come forward and speak on a topic of their choosing? The microphone is open. Okay. Seeing no one. We will next go to superintendent's report, Dr. Levine. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, first uh, report will be the uh, business manager, David Jack, if you would give your uh, report to the committee, please. In your packets, uh, I put a, uh, it's really a, uh, a very high level report rather than a detailed report, at least at this point. Um, the essence of the report is just to kind of bring you up to date where you stand uh, in terms of finances within the school district uh, at this point in the year. And what, the way that we uh, structured the report for, uh, for this uh, particular report was to look at the areas that had been what we knew were underfunded. Uh, this, was, uh, this was arrived at uh, uh, with discussions with the current administration also with Dave Keniston um, before he retired, uh, and uh, anything that we've seen along the way. So what we need to alert folks to is that we are really underfunded in the substitute accounts. Uh, I think that's something we've seen in past years as well. Uh, you know that uh, Circuit Breaker, uh, from the time that your budget was delivered uh, to the time that uh, was actually, uh, uh, that Circuit Breaker was actually finally arrived at was about $178,000 difference in what was predicted as opposed to what was really uh, uh, supported by the, uh, uh, by the legislature. Uh, we've got additional staffing needs that we've run into in the year. And when I say additional staffing needs, those are everything from additional uh, professional staff, teaching staff, as well as paraprofessionals. Uh, that would really comprise the bulk of that. So you, you have about $250,000 additional there. Uh, that were not part of the budget uh, for FY uh, 16. And then there are miscellaneous others for about 125,000. And those are really rough figures, but it really says that there's about a million dollars that we have got to address. Um, so like any good report, uh, we don't come here and tell you what all the problems are without what we think are the solutions at this point. So you've got utilities in the budget, this has been a very good year for utilities for a couple of, for, from a couple of uh, reasons. One is the, the weather is really cooperating, and two, we've seen a, a big drop in just the price of utility in general. Um, and that number is probably pretty solid because as we go forward, uh, we're running out of real estate. Uh, it's going to get warmer. Uh, you, it, when you get to this part of the year, uh, it doesn't matter how much of a winter we didn't have. 
but it's it's not going to be as severe. So we think that those those savings are uh, are really in line. Um, we the next piece that you go to is to is to try and look in other parts of the budget where there might be some money. We have about a hundred thousand dollars with uh, some other grants that we can take money from as well as E-rate money. So these are more along a revolving account uh, piece in, in the case of the E-rate. The technology budget, um, this is a little bit, uh, we're using 230 to support that right now. That changes almost on a daily basis depending on how we, uh, how we look at that. We had some discussions today uh, which may make that, uh, we may have to come up with some other opportunities as opposed to just that alone. But I would say there's at least 200,000 there that's available. Uh, at the time we talked, it was a pair, uh, approximately 230,000. Um, you ha you have in the budget this year, uh, and you went through the bidding procedure uh, process uh, to purchase six buses. Uh, we uh, have identified uh, we are going through that process as we speak. Uh, it's been delayed, and that's been good for you and your budget because by delaying it, uh, it means that we we prob the buses are aren't going to arrive here probably till after July 1st which means that we can just move the, the leasing, the payment of the lease to the FY17 budget. All we're doing is extending it on the other end. It allows us to, uh, to take that, the current money that you've allocated in the budget for FY16 and utilize it this year. Uh, so that is a possibility. Uh, you've got a $70 million budget uh, of which uh, 24, 25 million of that is uh, non-salary pieces. There's probably opportunities there. We think there's another 150,000 that'll be left at the end of the year. Historically, you've had that kind of money's left. Uh, the rental revolving has some money in it as well that we can utilize to support some of this. And when you put choice revenue out this year, I think you used a number of around 360,000. That's what you thought. Uh, choice probably is going to come in another 100,000 beyond that in this year. So that's a good news thing. Uh, that you'll have an opportunity to do and that we can help support some of this. This by no means is a final number. Uh, I'm just bringing it up now because I don't think we brought it up before and I think it's important that this group know uh, what, we're, what we have going here and what we're doing to resolve the issues. Great. Thank you, Mr. Jack. Uh, we have some questions, Mrs. Carpenter. Thank you. Through the chair, Mr. Jack, thank you for that very detailed report. Um, the additional staffing uh, that was added in after we closed on the budget, you said that was multiple positions. Was it, uh, I know that we were made aware that there was multiple para positions. Uh, what were the other positions that came in with that I don't, number? I, I will get those for you. I do not have those exactly, but the bulk of that was paraprofessionals. Okay. But I will come up with a, we'll, I'll give you a, the additional staff as we come forward with the next report. Very good. And uh, one other question through the chair to Dr. Levine. Could we possibly get some information, some enrollment numbers on that choice revenue? We came up to, uh, Mr. Jack said um, 360,000. That's a really high number. I'm really curious to see where all these kids are and how many numbers there are with them. Sure. I can get that for you. Um, and through the chair, um, we added a couple of professional staff. For example, we added a teacher of the deaf. Um, it's interesting how things work. We celebrated a student uh, coming out of one program into a uh, regular ed program. Um, in order to do that, however, we needed to add a full-time teacher of the deaf in order to teach her in the new building that she was going to be in. So these are things that happen throughout the year periodically. Um, there aren't a whole lot of people that we added uh, professionally because of class size, even though I will warn you that uh, some of our first grade class sizes are beginning to get um, large, uh, too large. Um, and next year I think we'll be adding some second grade teachers. Uh, so. Um, we will uh, happily get you the uh, uh, particular details, but you're going to find that the 80%, 90% of the bulk of, of uh, the monies that were expended were on paraprofessionals that were not budgeted originally. 
Thank you. Mr. Rosnall? Just for clarification, those paraprofessionals that were additions were more or less um, special ed based and more or less mandated by their IEPs, correct? Yeah, absolutely. And legitimately, um, during the year, we find uh, by law, we're supposed to uh, make certain that kids have an opportunity for the least restrictive environment. After a certain number of weeks or maybe even months, if there's no progress, we may have to revisit whether or not that child needs, in order to function, a, a paraprofessional. So there are legitimate reasons to add paraprofessionals throughout the year as well. Great. Thank you, Mr. Hockman. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to uh, thank uh, Mr. Jack for the report. Um, it does raise some concerns, but I think in a budget of $69 million, there's an expectation that there's going to be some deviation during the course of the year, and I'm glad that we're addressing it now rather than in April, so thank you for being on top of it. You too, Dr. Levine. And I'd also like to recognize uh, Will Verbitz, who's our uh, administrator for special education, and recognize and thank him that we're not seeing any uh, areas of unfunded um, costs associated with special education other than perhaps some additional staffing. Uh, there have been years past where we've seen significant increases in those costs that weren't um, expressed in the budget and uh, realized during the course of the year. So I just want to uh, give him kudos for doing a, a tremendous job. Great. And, and I should mention, and thank you for bringing that up, Mr. Hockman, I, I should do this at the beginning of the meeting, make sure everybody uh, who's here is introduced. But um, Will Verbitz, our special ed director, is here at every meeting, and I appreciate him being here. I know the committee does as well. And Mr. Jack and, and, and Charles Charette, our human resources director, are regular, uh, regular uh, visitors here at our meetings as well. And we do appreciate having you here. Sometimes um, you're not called upon to speak or whatever, but having you here does assist us. And uh, when things come up that we do need some of your expertise on, it's nice to have you here. So we appreciate you being here. And, and uh, thank you again, Mr. Jack, for your report. And, uh, it is appreciated. Okay, uh, I'll turn it back over to you, Dr. Levine. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Charlie, do you have anything uh, in the personnel area? Actually, I do not this evening, Dr. Levine. Thank you for being here, Charlie. Um, I did want to underscore the substitute account. We, we are going to have to make some structural adjustments to that account uh, in, in the uh, 17 budget. Just so you'll know, we're already overspent in that account, and we haven't hit the high time for substitutes um, coming up now. I'm terribly sorry. I need to recuse myself from this portion of the meeting because two of my children have served as substitutes. So I'm just going to step away while you discuss that account, and I'll come back. And I needed to say it at the very beginning. That's fine. I, I'm done with the substitute account. I just wanted to bring an update. That's all. I'm done. <laughs> Welcome back, Mrs. Dunn. <laughs> that was a good try, though, Bib. <laughs> um, I, would ask, I would ask at this time, by the way, uh, David Jack has done a terrific job since he's been here, um, as, of course, did David Keniston. Uh, David and I literally talk every day. Uh, about the budget. We are trying very, very hard to get this budget to zero uh, by the end of the year. Um, we have made up a significant number of dollars uh, that was structurally deficient in this budget, uh, and now we're scraping um, for every dollar uh, to get to zero. So uh, bear with us. We'll continue to update you and uh, 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 working together. Uh, if we don't get to the goal, uh, we'll get darn close. Um, I would ask the uh, mayor to ask for a uh, motion to accept the director of vocational school and programs new job description. When we complete uh, the business manager's search, Mr. Mayor, we will be going out for a director of uh, vocational programs as our longtime director of vocational programs, Maria Ferry, will be retiring at the end of this year. Thank you. And would someone like to make that motion? This is done. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to make a motion to follow the recommendation of the superintendent and to uh, utilize the proposed job description for director of vocational school programs. So move. Second. Thank you. You've heard the motion by Mrs. Dunn, seconded by Mrs. Carpenter. Roll call vote, please. Mr. Hockney? Yes. Mr. Rosenberg? Yes. Mrs. Yes. 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 
Thank you. And uh, Mr. Mayor, I just uh, have in the packet a letter from Mr. Buckley regarding the uh, community service program. Uh, Mr. Buckley and the staff are working very hard in order to make this program what it was that you envisioned when you approved it in the first place. And I want to thank Mr. Buckley and all the, who are involved in this, including Maria Ferry, as a matter of fact, um, in helping uh, uh, craft uh, and get off the ground this uh, community service program. Uh, and lastly, um, the business administrator uh, committee met today. Uh, we agreed on uh, uh, the interview for semifinalists, which will take place on February 22nd, uh, at which time I hope to have a recommendation to you for hire for a school business administrator. Um, uh, the committee was uh, very much in agreement, and uh, we had a very productive uh, meeting. And with that, I am done with my uh, report, Mr. Mayor. Great. Thank you, and I'm very pleased about uh, moving forward with the community service requirement for our students. And I just wanted to give a quick thank you to Mr. Rosignol, who was uh, spearheaded this as well and, and for making this happen. I think this will be wonderful for our students going forward, learn some valuable lessons about community service. And, and, um, and I just want to thank Mr. Rosignol uh, for, for really pushing that forward himself. Mr. Chairman. Yep, this is done. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just one thing I would like to add. Thank you. I'm very pleased about the community service. I'd just like to ask and put in a put in a, a, a plug for the PTSO at the high school. They've been very interested in helping with this project all along. It's a dedicated group of parents. And I'd like to just ask that you make sure that they have been contacted to see if they are still willing to help. They had a couple of ideas on how they would be able to assist with this program as far as being a clearinghouse, generating leads, they're professional women, and, and they were very, very devoted to this project. Thank you. And, and through the mayor, um, out of this uh, uh, discussion at this table from um, the school committee uh, came a concern about making certain that uh, kids who didn't have easy access to community service placement got easy access, and that is on the agenda of uh, the, the uh, principal to work with his group. So thank you for, uh, these discussions are very important because they actually mean something at, uh, in reality. And uh, uh, thank you very much for those recommendations. Thank you, next item is written communications. Uh, we have one communication from the PBD City Council regarding voting in schools. If there's, if there's no objection, I can, perhaps it's the appropriate time for me to give the uh, executive session a report. Um, we had an executive session meeting prior to the meeting this evening. Uh, there were a couple of items on the agenda. Primarily, it was a review of our, um, uh, our contracts, our negotiation, and our strategy as we move forward with the continuing negotiations with uh, each of the units. Uh, but one of the items that came out from the um, from the discussion uh, was something that we as a committee felt needed to be discussed in open session, and that was the calendar issue. Uh, that is also part of the negotiations uh, with the various unions. And um, there were two items under the calendar issue. One was the voting in schools, and then also was the holiday um, Rosh Hashanah. And uh, we felt that that uh, needed to be discussed in open session. Uh, we also have, as I mentioned, the written communication from the PBD City Council. Um, is there anybody that would like to open the discussion on voting in schools? Mrs. Carpenter, why don't you start us off? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just to give a little bit of history uh, for the new members of how this has been going for the past seven to eight years about voting in schools. Um, I had originally brought it up when it was during uh, an election was coming up for the presidential election for Obama and it was gonna be a, a, a heavy voter turnout um, and there was concern of the um, larger than normal crowds coming that day. The board had decided that we were going to close on that day and we negotiated having a professional development day. It was my intention at that time, and I did inform the committee at that time, that eventually I would be seeking to remove voting from our school buildings. Um, over the years, we as a board 
worked with the Board of Registrars to try to identify and see if it was feasible for us to remove polling locations from our buildings. We did identify many locations that could handle polling other than our school buildings. Letters were sent to the City Council to let them know that we were going to proceed with this. And um, they were not in favor of it and they assumed that they were in control of the school buildings and essentially rejected it. Um, so the latest letter that was sent to them was explaining to them that the school committee has full authority over school buildings. When they had, had discussed this, um, I was told by mistake that it wouldn't be discussed, so I did not come to the meeting where you have the minutes of them discussing it, because I didn't actually believe it was going to be spoken about. So I was not there to state our position that we voted on in case they were not listening to us. I did attend the last meeting where we had sent them a letter um, with all of the backup of all of the meetings that we had had. Um, and I let them, I let the, um, the chair know that I was there and available to speak for any questions. And I was not called upon. And it appears that um, Councillor Gould moved to send us a letter that they already discussed it and they would like to keep it the way that it is. So further history on this is that this board had sent them a letter that our intention was for the 2015-16 school year that the polling places would be moved. We held that back because we were unsure of what we were going to do with the Kylie building. So to not try to force anybody out and try to work with them, we said that we would wait until we could figure that out. We're now at the 2016-17 meeting. We sent them a letter that says, you know, it's time to move on and proceed with what the board voted, which was to remove the polling locations. After the city council meeting where I was not given an opportunity to speak, I went over and spoke to Mr. Gould about it as well as Councillor Gravel. And basically what Councillor Gravel told me was that he is going to stonewall every attempt that this board makes by denying every request that the Board of Registrars makes to identify and move a new polling location, which I find highly unethical and an abuse of power. We've made a decision, we've made a vote, and it should be carried out. I spoke to Councillor Gould and we talked about having a joint meeting to try to discuss these items, which I don't have a problem with. We had a joint meeting with the Board of Registers and we worked out everything. If there was no alternative location, then we have a problem. Many alternative locations were found. Many people will say that myself or some members of this board are just trying to keep voters out of our buildings. That is not the intent. We open our buildings many times during the year. The public is welcome to come in to any of our sporting events, any of our craft shows, any of our concerts. They can request a private tour anytime they want. This is not to keep the public out of our buildings. This is a matter of it's no longer feasible. It's, it no longer makes sense for this to happen. What's going to happen if we have a lockdown on an election day? We've had plenty of cases where there's been discrepancies about votes. What's going to happen if we tell people they can't come in? Nope, you can't come in, it's a lockdown. Or while you're in there voting, I want you to go crawl under that table and stay there until the police tell you you can come out. These aren't the buildings they used to be. We have so many other, re we have parking issues, we have recess issues, we're violating our own policy. 
Our policy says if the sponsoring organization schedules events and activities, they cannot interfere with our regular, regular educational program. This isn't about letting weirdos, as some people will say, into the, our buildings and trying to keep the public out. This is about practical reasons now. There are many other locations. I'm not going to sit here and demand that this happen and, you know, we took a vote. I feel very disrespected by a council who will not acknowledge our authority. But I will, however, ask Mrs. Dunn, as the liaison, as your subcommittee is with the city council, if you could please set up a meeting with the city council, one of our meetings, and have them meet with us so that we can discuss it. Because there's a lot of things in these minutes that are wrong. They're misinformed. And I don't appreciate it at all. In regards to the calendar, because I was told by Mr. Gravel it will be stonewalled, I don't want to cause a problem for anybody. Please move forward with elections and schools. but please schedule that meeting. I just want to point out, some people say, oh, how come you can't just schedule professional development? Do you know how many special elections we've had that we can't schedule? We don't know that they're going to happen. We have to put the calendar out now. We don't know when there's going to be a special election. There's been so many of them in Peabody. So it doesn't just happen that way. Because yes, it was a good, it, it was a good answer for the November election. We have professional development. It's perfect. The schools are closed. There's nobody there. But we can't predict them all. So I will ask Mrs. Dunn if she could please schedule that so we can speak to the city councilors who would like to discuss it. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Carpenter. Any other comments, Mrs. Dunn? And thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would be glad to have our subcommittee do that and set up a meeting. I think it might help quite a bit. Um, I will say, for the record, having looked through the minutes from the City Council, one of the problems is it's definitely an issue of communication. What their minutes show is that the City Clerk had gone to them in, in um, June to request a move from the high school to the Smith Barn. And it was actually requested because it would make the job of the clerk easier. They have so, many, so few people voting at the high school that it was going to work out better for the clerk's office to have two precincts at the Smith Barn. So the request that the city council was, was addressing, honestly, at that moment, hadn't even been generated by the school committee's uh, request to remove voting from the schools. It actually turned out that voting at the Smith Barn worked better for the clerks and they thought they could get the other, um, the other precinct in there as well. So there, there are parallel tracks running here about the issue of voting in the schools versus what the clerk wanted and on this, on this one, on this specific one, uh, actually, the school committee is kind of caught in the middle. But I do think that it might help if we did have a joint meeting so that they could understand where the school committee members are coming from. Um, as you know, I'm the one who voted to keep it in the school, so I'll, you know, I'll be very happy to, to mediate that and to be able to have that kind of a joint meeting. Thank you, Mrs. Dunn, for that. So in terms of this calendar, um, the committee would be comfortable um, allowing for the voting, I think it would just be right now, if there's, unless there's a special election, it would just be that primary date in September of 2016. Uh, again, if the, not planning on any uh, special elections. And then we put it into the committee, Mrs. Dunn, for, um, for, 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 for further discussion. For, for, for discussion Mrs. Carpenter of the makes it, yeah. Right. Okay. To straighten it out once and for all. And I think we all know the city solicitor's opinion and, and mm -hmm. things, so I, I, I think that is a discussion that has to be had. Actually, Mr. Chairman and, and to the other members, it very definitely does need to be discussed, and um, the opinion of the city solicitor is one that I don't think the councilors understand. 
on, okay. on, on a couple of we different can have, levels. We can ask, I can ask uh, our city solicitor to be there at that mm -hmm. meeting as well. So, Dr. Levine, would you like a motion? Uh, just a clarification. Um, I'm assuming that the direction of the committee will be for me to move uh, an August professional development day to September 8th? No, no, it's not. That is not? Okay, so simply to allow the, uh, the elections to take place on a school day, September 8th, okay. Uh, just a second. Ms. Carpenter? So the other election that we have to deal with that we know about is September 8th. So that would, if you moved an August PD date, that would be only three days of school in that week. That's the primary? Would it, that's the presidential primary? Yes, and uh, it will also be our state rep, it will be state offices as well. I just want to be clear on what that is. Yeah, that the, I believe it's September 8th. It, it's, um, and uh, there will be the presidential as well as, uh, I know our state representative. No, there won't be a president. no, no, presidential. No, presidential is March 1st. March 1st. But there will be a state representative should there, should there be the need of one. Or um, state, state senator. senator. I, I, don't, I don't think there would be any others besides those two. State senator, state representative. What? Governor's Council. So there will be state o some state offices if there's a need to. That's a primary. So we're not even sure that we need to have, that's a primary election. That's a primary election. So we don't, depending on the number of candidates, we yeah, don't know. Yeah, so that we yeah. might not even have anything. Yeah, so I wouldn't want to schedule a day off if we don't even know. Okay. Okay. Uh, Mr. Miko, then Mr. Hockman. Through the chair, actually, I was, I was going to say what Brandy had said, uh, excuse me, Mrs. Carpenter had said, probably not even taking that day off um, and having the students in, in school in session because of the same reason, only two or three days in school that week and uh, breaking up that consistency right off the bat. So having them in school would be my way to go. Thank you. Mr. Hockman? Uh, yes, I think we're talking about the calendar in general. So I didn't want to speak about elections, if, unless anyone else wanted to and I can yield. Um, so. The, the, only, the only thought I would have about the, the calendar, and I brought it up uh, previously, is looking at the calendar that was presented by the superintendent, and I thank him for, and his uh, administrative team for supplying it to us, and I appreciate that he's already consulted with the president of the teachers union relative to the document that's before us. But I just note, and I may, I may wind up being in the minority here, and I think I may be, but I do note that the second week of October, um, there's no school on the Monday because it's Columbus Day on the 10th. And then on the 12th, which is the Wednesday, there's also no school because of a bargain for day off. Um, and I, I thought that this was an opportunity um, f to have a, a, a nice long weekend in October for families and uh, students to have a little break, teachers to have a little bit of a break as well. Uh, I don't know what kind of continuity exists when there's um, three days off, one day on, then one day off, and then back on. So I just throw it out to the committee as uh, a possibility, a suggestion, I, I guess, if you will, uh, of taking a day off on October 11. And I will note that as far as the last date for, for school in the um, calendar that's before us, with the snow days, it shows as June 22. That's with five snow days built in. And I submit that that's inaccurate as June 16th is not um, counted as one of the dates. So the last date without taking this additional date off would be June 21. The last date with taking the additional day off could be June 22. And I submit that you're getting what you're, at, what you're seeking anyway, having a last possible school with five slow days as June 22 by taking October 11 off. Thank you, Mr. Hockman. Mr. Rosigno? Thank you. Um, I wouldn't be in favor of that only because I want the kids out as soon as possible. Any time that we can take days out in the middle of the year, I would always and forever be in favor of the more we can get them in school on a continuous basis, the better. I understand your point. 
and, and it's a valid one, I'm always fearful that the longer we push our end date in June, we end up having a bad s snow that year and we're clamoring to try to get days back that we don't necessarily have. So for, for, for me, I would not be in favor of that. Um, but I, I do understand and appreciate your point. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Amico, then Mrs. Carpenter. Through the chair. Uh, the kid and all of us would love that day off. <laughs> I, do, um, I do worry about consistency, though, um, and getting in enough school days um, early on, because uh, uh, another day loss is another day not preparing for, for the test in, in May or MCAS, whenever that is. So um, again, just having that consistency and, uh, and having as many days on the front end of the school year versus on the back end. And, but again, the kid in me loves the three or four day weekend, so I agree. <laughs> Mr. Hockman, yeah. Yeah, thank you, and I appreciate the, the conversation, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad it's taking the tone it's taking. Frankly, I envision, we, we've just looked, and Mr. Jack gave us a report on the, the overage on the substitute line, and frankly, I just see that as an opportunity that we're not going to have real instruction. Uh, and I didn't want to be as blunt as, as I am now about it, but that's the way I envision it. And rather than have our kids sitting with substitutes, I thought it might be an opportunity. And Mrs. Carpenter. Thank you. Um, uh, through the chair, Dr. Levine, the November 3rd day of Rosh Hashanah, that has been something that we've discussed before. Has the union had a chance to review this calendar and are we in agreement with that date? Through the chair, uh, the union and I met quite a while ago on this uh, uh, document. Um, I would feel more comfortable uh, saying that they're in agreement when I go back to them uh, and uh, review it. But that was not brought up as an issue uh, at the time that the union president and I discussed this uh, this calendar. So I would like to uh, revisit this with the union president um, before uh, giving you a final answer on that. Mr. Rosignol. Thank you. Through the chair, Dr. Levine. My understanding is, is, is our obligation with the union and, and its president is to inform them of decisions we make in a timely manner. I, I don't think we necessarily need union approval for the calendar. That technically is under our purview. Um, so, I mean, I'd be willing, and, and, and actually I will, I'll make a motion to adopt the calendar as stated with Rosh Hashanah out and um, with the correct start and finish dates. So moved. Would Mr. Rosen, will you just hold that for a minute just because there's a couple of people that I didn't want to speak before we go to the motion. If you could just hold Fair that enough. motion for a moment. Mr. Olympio? Was that October 3rd, not November 3rd? I'm sorry. Is it October 3rd, Rosh Hashanah? Uh, yes. Okay, okay, not November, okay. Is there anybody else who would like to comment before we go to Mr. Rosignol's motion? Okay. So we have a motion made by Mr. Rosignol to approve the calendar. Second. Seconded by Mr. Amico. Roll call vote, please. Yes. Yes. No. No. Yes. Yes. Okay. It's been approved four to two. Okay. Next item, we can go to subcommittee reports. Let's see, we have subcommittee reports, uh, education. Mr. Hockman, anything to report? Push your button, Chair. Thank you. I apologize. Uh, Mr. Mayor, to report from the Education Committee, we anticipate having a meeting uh, of the Curriculum and Instruction Subcommittee on uh, February 23 at 6 p.m., uh, date to, uh, location to be determined, and then also a meeting of the Special Education Subcommittee uh, on March 8th at 6 p.m., 
uh, again, location to be determined. Thank you. Finance, Mrs. Carpenter. Thank you. The Finance Committee is in active negotiations with Unit B. Unit C asks me, um, we are preparing to ratify with the Teachers Union, and we will schedule that um, shortly. Thank you. Thank you. School safety, Mrs. Carpenter? Nothing to report at this time. Athletics and wellness, Mr. Rosignol? Nothing to report at this time, but I know that there has been some discussion under the turf committee that was established um, instituting the high school turf with Ms. Dunn, uh, Mr. Hockman, myself, and Mr. Sheridan, and Jen Davis regarding the maintenance of that field. Currently in his budget, I believe he has about $5,000 as a line item for the maintenance of that field. I know that he's going to be looking for monies moving forward to um, time, not, not time, um, basically to groom the field and to also add rubber um, pallets, uh, pellets into the field. So I will be coming forward with Mr. Hockman and, and Ms. Dunn's permission with what he's looking for for next year's budget. Um, and under wellness, um, I would also like to make a motion to put contraception into that subcommittee. Second. All in favor? It's approved. Thank you, Mr. Rosignol. Uh, quality and standards, Mrs. Dunn? Nothing at this point. Thank you. Um, lia liaison to City Council and Advisory Board, Mrs. Dunn? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the upcoming Parent Advisory Board meeting is going to take place Monday, February 22nd, place to be determined. Uh, it will begin at 7 p.m. Um, the uh, matter of the voting in the schools to be referred to the, uh, the liaison subcommittee, I would just like to ask that, that, that the uh, issue be put into that subcommittee. So I'll make a motion in that, in that regard. We, um Seconded by Mr. Hockman. All in favor? Thank you, Mrs. Dunn. Uh, building and grounds. We did have a, a building and grounds meeting uh, prior to this evening. I haven't had the opportunity to put everything in order. I'd like to make that report at the next meeting. Great. Any, uh, any further comments on new business? Um, we could uh, handle that in a regular course of business. Motion to adjourn. Great. Thank you so much. Second. Good meeting. Thank you.